Chapter 4 is all about quadratic functions. We're actually going to split this chapter into two parts. The first part of Chapter 4 is all about graphing. In Lesson 4.1, we're going to take a look at graphing quadratic functions in standard form. Let's start off with a little review from Chapter 2. It says, determine if the equation is linear or nonlinear. In our first example, y equals negative 4x plus 8, that looks like slope-intercept form for a line, and our exponent for x is just 1. So yes, that is a linear function. To the right, y equals 2x squared, when you raise the exponent for the variable, that no longer is a linear function. We would classify this as nonlinear. In the next example, we have a linear function in general form or standard form, 3x plus y equals 1. Even though x and y are on the same side, notice they both only have an exponent of 1, therefore it is a linear function. In our last, in our, wow, in our last equation, we have x squared and x, and notice there isn't even a y, it's just equal to 0. But because of that squared in the x term, or that first term, that would be a nonlinear function again. So remember, any linear function has to have a degree of 1, like x to the first power. Well, in chapter 4, we're going to change all that. We're going to explore a new type of function. A quadratic function has an exponent of the or has a biggest exponent of 2 for your variable. y equals x squared would be the quadratic parent function. Parabola is actually the name of the shape of the graph of a quadratic function. As you can see on the right, it's not a straight line. It has kind of a curve or a non-linear shape to it. So let's look at some specifics for this parent function. There are some similarities to a quadratic function uh, based off of what we did with absolute value functions back in chapter 2. Notice at the very bottom that turning point or that vertex is at 0, 0 just like it was for absolute value. Now an axis of symmetry just kind of gives you a boundary line where we can reflect over to get one point to another point on the other side. Now the axis of symmetry goes right through the middle of the graph along the y-axis. And the equation for the axis of symmetry would be x equals zero. If you recall from chapter two, anything with just x in it would be the equation for a vertical boundary line. Also notice on this equation, the y-intercept is at 0, 0 as well. So how did they get the other points? If we follow the definition y equals x squared, well, 0 squared would be 0. 1 squared would be 1, so that's how they get that point on the right. But even negative 1, like if we took negative 1 and squared it, we would also get 1, and that's how they get that point on the left. Notice the symmetry over that axis line. 2 to the right, 2 squared would be 4, there's that point up here, and then negative 2, also if you square the entire part, gives you that positive 4. And then what they do is just draw a smooth curve through the lines, and we're going to make sure to include arrows up at the very top. Now this is the most basic version of a quadratic function. From here we can change the vertex just like we did with absolute value, we can make it open up or down by changing the a value. And we can make that general shape either stretch or compress just like we did with our absolute value functions. So essentially what we'll do is we'll be performing transformations on this equation, similar to what we did with absolute value. Let's start our transformations by focusing on the coefficient in front of x squared. That would be the a value. If you recall from absolute value functions, when a, the absolute value of a is greater than 1, we describe the shape as stretches vertically. If the absolute value of a is between 0 and 1, the graph compresses vertically. And then remember, negative does something totally different. If your a coefficient is negative, the graph reflects over the x-axis. 
So we're gonna describe our transformations just like we did in chapter two, and then sketch the graph. You'll notice for each example on the right, I already have the parent function drawn in for you so that we can see the transformation. We're asked to describe the transformation, then sketch the graph. If we have f of x equals negative four x squared, that means a equals negative four. Easy enough. So to describe in words the change or the transformation of the parent function, the absolute value of negative four is just four. And that's greater than one. Because of that, we would say that this graph will stretch vertically. Let's so make sure to write that down. And we'll show that with our graph. Because a is negative, we're also going to be able to describe it as reflecting over the x-axis. Now what makes this more like a little bit unique from absolute value is it's not a straight line in each direction. So we're not going to be able to think of it as like a slope that goes in one direction and then another. It doesn't quite work that way for quadratic functions. So let's take a look at that picture down below. At this point, we know that our vertex or our turning point is still zero, zero. But if I go one to the right, normally the graph goes up one. So one, one would be the parent function. But if I go one to the right and plug that into f of x equals negative four x squared, watch what happens to my output. I'm just gonna make a little table here. If I plug in positive one, negative four times one squared, well think order of operations, we have to do the one squared first, and that's just one, but times negative four would equal negative four. So watch this. If we go one to the right, it drops all the way down to negative four. And if I go to the other side, negative one, negative four times negative one squared. Again, think your order of operations. Negative one squared becomes one times negative four. So notice the reflection right on the other side. If we connect these three points with a curve, a nonlinear shape, it's a little different looking than absolute value. Oops, kind of missed that there. Let's try to get through that. There we go. And then on the other side, do the same thing. Oh, missing that. There we go, a little bit better there. So you can see how that graph stretches vertically and it reflects over the x-axis. All right, let's try one more on the right. This time we have g of x equals one-third x squared, so now a equals one-third. The absolute value of one-third obviously is just one-third, and that's between zero and one. Because of that, we would describe this graph as compresses vertically. So it's not gonna open up quite as steep as the parent function. So let's test that out down below. We know that our vertex is going to stay the same, but now 1, 1 is going to go somewhere else. If we plug in 1 for x to just verify what's happening here, 1 third times 1 squared stays 1 third. And if we flip it to the other side and plug in negative 1, 1 third times negative 1 squared would still give us 1 third. So watch this on the graph. If we go to the right, we're just going up a third for our new shape. And then the same thing on that left-hand side. That's a point, there we go. If I plug in two, watch this, one third times two squared. Well, by definition, order of operations, two squared is four, and one third times four would be four thirds. So if I go over to two, I'm gonna go up one and basically one third. Oh boy, right in that mess right there. Let's clean that up. We don't want that in our way. So one and one third is the same as four thirds, so up a little bit higher. And then I'm just gonna reflect that to the other side at negative two, we know it's gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna try one more, plug in three. And if we take one third times three squared, well three squared is nine, and one third times nine, well that's just three. So watch this, if we go three, we're gonna go all the way up to three over here, and then negative three would give us that same output. So as we connect these points, see how the graph kind of opens up a little bit wider than the parent function? 
That means those points are compressing or getting closer to the x-axis, and they're not getting quite as steep as that parent function. And that's just what the a value does. Flip it over and we'll see other ways we can transform these quadratic functions. A quadratic function in standard form has an x squared term and an x term. So ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are coefficients or numbers. So you know you're going to have a transformation of the vertex if you have an x squared term and then another term that has an x in it and then maybe something being added at the end. So these are important steps, all four of them, for sketching the graph of this type of quadratic function. Whoops, sorry about that. Let's erase that line down here. So the first thing you're going to want to do is calculate where the new vertex is. This is going to be the most amount of work in step one. Once you get through this step, the rest of them should be pretty easy. So the formula to figure out where that new vertex goes starts off by taking x equals negative b over 2a. Get to know that formula. You're going to use that a lot. And if that fraction can be simplified, always do that before, step, or before the second part. To get the y value of the vertex, you're just going to plug that x value back into your equation. When you're done, you write it as an ordered pair. That's step one. And again, that's the most amount of work. The rest of it should be pretty easy after that. Step two, we're going to translate that axis of symmetry. So remember on the front, we drew it right on the y-axis where x equals zero. Well, if we're changing where the vertex goes, we're also going to change the axis of symmetry. And get this, the equation is the same as what you did up in step one. But make sure it's in equation form, and then you draw that dashed vertical line. And that's all you do for axis of symmetry. From there, it's pretty easy to calculate the y-intercept. The y-intercept, if you plugged in 0 for x, everything would cancel out except for that constant at the end. So whatever c is up above, that's where the y-intercept is. And then we want to just find some symmetry with this shape by finding a reflection point. Take your y-intercept and then reflect it over the axis of symmetry. And that should give you enough information to sketch that nonlinear shape for the parabola of that quadratic function. However, sometimes it doesn't look like you have enough information. So when all else fails, you can find other points by simply making a table. And we'll have to do that over on the right. All right, are you ready? It says list the key features of each quadratic function, then sketch the graph. The key features are just those four steps on the left-hand side. So we're going to state the vertex, the axis of symmetry, the y-intercept, and then find a reflecting point. All right, so first thing we're going to do is find the vertex. I want to make sure we're clear on what the coefficients are. So I know a equals 2, b equals negative 8, and c equals positive 6. Those are going to be the numbers we use in our work. To get that vertex, step one. And again, this is the most amount of work. It's going to be an ordered pair answer when we're done. Okay, well, I did that last time. Hang on, in my notes, not on here. <laughs> in my notes, I did that. Here we go. So I'm just writing an ordered pair to getting that set up. All right, so underneath this, I'm going to write x equals negative b over 2a. Now, b is already negative, so if I do a negative b, we get a double negative in the numerator. 2 times a would be 2 times 2. And then it said simplify that fraction. The double negative on top would make it positive 8. And then 2 times 2 in the denominator is 4. And 8 divided by 4 is 2. So that's half of our vertex. To get the y-coordinate, we're going to take 2 and plug it back in for x in the equation. So we have 2 times 2 squared minus 8 times 2 plus 6. This is where order of operations and attention to detail are going to be helpful. If we think order of operations, it's important to note you have to do the exponent first. 2 squared is 4, and if we take 2 times 4, we would get 8. 8 times 2 is 16, so we have 8 minus 16, and then plus 6, plus 6. So 8 minus 16 plus 6 equals negative 2, and that's the y-coordinate for the vertex. So that's all just step one. But remember, that's the easiest part, or that's the most amount of work. After that, the rest of it should be easy. 
So down on your graph, let's go ahead and plot 2, negative 2. I'm just going to slide this down a little bit. 2 to the right and down 2. There's our turning point for this quadratic function. Step 2, write your axis of symmetry equation. Remember, it's the same answer that we got up here, so that's the easy part. X equals positive 2. And we're just going to draw that dashed vertical line all the way through our vertex. That means everything on one side should reflect over to the other side. We now need our y-intercept. And again, this is also pretty easy. The y-intercept is just that last number, that constant of c. So that would be 0, 6. Let's go ahead and plot that on the y-axis. And then it says the reflection point, so here's how this works. Notice the y-intercept is two units away on, from the axis of symmetry, so I'm just going to reflect it to the other side, right here like so, and that point is at 4, 6. All I did was I took my, my y-intercept and just reflected it over that line, but I'm just going to erase that so that it doesn't mess with my shape at all. Notice we have our vertex at the bottom, right here, we have our y-intercept on the left, and then our reflection point on the right. Let's draw a curve through those points. Bring it back up. Arrows at the top. And there is your parabola, the shape for a quadratic function. And that's enough, I think, for this video. We will finish the rest of our notes tomorrow in class.